Et voilà. Webinar. This is a new webinar uh, specifically on, on farmland acquisition um, for access to land, so for agroecological uh, agriculture. And this webinar is part of an Erasmus Plus uh, partnership uh, in which we are trying to make a, a learning platform so we can learn from each other and um, give advice and expertise to other access to land organizations. It is um, Europe who is investing in us. Today, we are two partners who will be the speakers. And that is on one hand, uh, the Landgenoten, um, the Landgenoten, I should say in Dutch. Um, we are operating in the Flemish part of Belgium. And we have by now uh, 33 hectares uh, supporting uh, 10 farms. And we are planning to buy another six or even more hectares uh, to, um, uh, in, in, in 2021. Uh, the other partner who will um, explain their ways of working is Kulturland. And Thomas will explain later um, who they are and how they work. Um, Dolce, is there anything you would like to share with us? Um, do you already have an idea of an organization um, or a region? I, I heard you say in Catalonia. Yeah, so I am uh, Catalan, originally from, from Lleida, for Maria to know. Um, I don't have any background in agriculture. I mean, I just come from a, from a farmer's family. So I've been always very close, but uh, right now I'm working in a completely different corporate world. And I'm just thinking uh, possibilities to maybe change the, the career and to go back. Uh, I've been researching a little bit about regenerative agriculture. Uh, so some sustainability practices as well. So for me, it's more just to learn. I'm here to learn as much as I can about uh, different things and, and today on how to buy farms or access land. Mm -hmm. and see if this can help me also decide a little bit in my future. Okay, great. I think you're the perfect goal public. You're yes. the, the <laughs> kind of person that we are looking for. Great. Thank you for hosting this. Uh, so what can you expect today? Uh, today we will talk specifically on land acquisition. So I will explain and, and Thomas also uh, the general workflow. And then how do we select farmland? How do we select farmers? Uh, what do we put in the agreement with the farmer and then what happens after agreement or what responsibilities does this um, uh, being a landowner bring uh, along and what will not be part of the webinar but what can you find somewhere um, somewhere else it's uh, how to crowdfund that's a webinar that Thomas gave on another moment and it will be available on the website of access to land it's um, maybe all already available on Vimeo, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, then and there is an, a webinar which might be very interesting for you also. That is, we call it the beginner's kit. That is an, a webinar explaining how to start an organization um, to, to help people work on uh, farmlands in Europe and also how to define a strategy because there's, there's many strategies possible that we, we are talking about land acquisition, but you can easily do a lot of other things to, um, to help access to land for farmers. So there's another webinar. And then there's a webinar on um, impact assessments. Once you have farms or your, um, uh, helping farms, how can you assess the impact of those farms? That's, an, that's a specific webinar that we made. So all those webinars will be found on the Access to Land website uh, within a week. Okay, so the general workflow. At the Landgenoten, uh, we, the way we work is we start from the farmer. So, um, we have a list of farmers who would like to work on farmlands of the Landsgenoten. And um, it's only after then that we are looking for farmland specifically for them. And the reason is, is, is uh, related to the context in, in uh, the Flemish part. Farmland is sold very, very quickly. Often you, you 
simply don't have time to, to think about it uh, and not time to, to find someone, to start looking for someone who will work on it. So it's very, very difficult for us to decide on a farmland if we don't have a farmer in mind. And that's why we turn it around. We always start from the farmer and then we go looking for farmland that uh, fits to his profile and his business plans. Um, it's very exceptional that we do it the other way around. Sometimes there's a landowner who comes to us and says, I really want you to manage this farmland, take your time, find a farmer, and, and then we can do a call for projects. That's when we have like a half a year time or even more, um, but that's rather exceptional. Um, this is our um, workflow but it, it doesn't have to be this way. I know from um, an organization in the UK who will first buy farmland and then take time to, um, to get the infrastructure uh, well done, uh, the water, the electricity, even a barn. And then they go, because that takes a lot of time, they cannot have farmers wait for this to uh, be developed. So they first do the farmland and then they go looking for the farmers. So it's, it's, it depends on um, the way your context um, is. And I see there are more people who joined welcome in this webinar. Now, how do we select the farmers? Um, we help farmers, new farmers, as well as settled ones. And we ask them why they want to work on uh, farmland of the Landskindled, why they want to work with us. And it can be um, for several reasons. The most, the most important are um, a startup, people who really want to start in agriculture. But it can also be a settled, uh, an active farmer who needs more security, who knows that his or a part of his farmland will be sold. Or it can be that a farmer comes to us and uh, explains that uh, there's more farmland needed to have um, the, the rotation that is needed. For example, sometimes an organic farmer uh, that turns into biodynamic often needs more farmland because it, it uh, requires more, um, how do you say it, more time before you put a, the same um, produce on the same uh, field. But it can also be an active farmer that would like his farm to be uh, to be bigger. Uh, for us, the main condition that's and that's really a condition that we never um, lose out of sight. The farmer has to be ready to work uh, organically, and there must be a certification. Uh, so that is really a condition. If the farmer doesn't like that, then um, we will not work together then what we find important is that the farmer that contacts us um, is educate well has a, a certain education a farmer education we believe that farming is 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 something um is is uh, how do you say it it's a profession it's not just uh, something that you uh, that anyone can do so you really need skills not only as a farmer but also as uh, an entrepreneur um, we really like people to have a little bit of experience um, because often we, we see that people who start farming after a year or after two years, they understand that it's um, not so easy as they thought it would be, especially the marketing of the produce might be quite, quite difficult. Um, we also want people to have a similar vision on common land as we do. Um, if someone would like to buy farmland for himself or herself, I'm, I'm often speaking about him, but of course it's the farmer can be a woman too. Um, so if a farmer would like to buy farmland for him or herself, then uh, that makes it very difficult to work together. So it's very important that the person um, find it a good idea to have the, the, the land in common hands. And of course, we always need a profitable business plan and uh, we need a focus on local sales and uh, local community building. Um, 
and then we need people to who are ready to be the face of crowdfunding. We expect people to, um, yeah, to to talk about it to um, to his or her network, and to ask people to invest to become shareholder. Now, how do we do it very specifically? We, we start with a questionnaire uh, for both new and active farmers. Um, then the new farmer will uh, be invited to the advisory boards that are, that are three or four persons uh, with um, quite some experience in agriculture and specifically in financial plans and with quite a network and um, we will revise this. This advisory board will revise uh, and and listen to the business plans. And we really want someone to be uh, inspired to to um, have this need to farm. Um, if it's an active farmer, we don't invite them because we did it once. We invited um, also the active farms to the advisory board. But then we found out that active farmers, especially people who already work like 15, 20 years, they felt like uh, they have had to, to do an exam. They had uh, to do a, a test. They didn't like it. And that, that um, in a way that at a certain point, they didn't contact it, uh, us anymore. So at this moment, what we do is we go ourselves to the active farmers and that is a plus because then we see the farm ourselves and we see how they work. And that, that tells a lot about um, their capacity. And then it's always the advisory board that decides. So it's always three or four persons who decide uh, commonly if we want to work with the farmer. Um, and then if yes, we start looking for farmland. Uh, that is a very difficult one here in uh, Flanders um, because farmland is uh, is sold so quickly, and we just started since uh, last year to work with volunteers um, who are looking together with us to availabilities and to to talk about it um, in the in the locality of uh, the farmer. We have. Um, a lot of farmers in our database, like I think at this moment, like 200 people already. Uh, a small part of those are already approved by the advisory board. board. And of course, those approved farmers will have um, the first uh, choice. If farmland is offered to us, we will always try to match with those approved farmers. If we don't find an approved farmer, then we will look at the other farmers. But um, and having those approved farmers will also be easy if they come to us at a certain point with uh, farmland, we can uh, decide very quickly to buy the farmland or not. Are there any questions on this part on how we um, do the workflow and on how we select the farmers? I have a question, Petra. Do you provide, uh, you said you you check also the business plan yeah. uh, for the farmers. Do you provide any kind of consult consultancy services to help them build it or some kind of guidance? Uh, well, we have a framework. It's an, it's an in fact, it's an, a quite, uh, it's an Excel sheet and it's, uh, it says everything that they have to note down. So if they use it, uh, they cannot um, forget anything. So it's very complete. And during the discussion with the advisory board, we also give advice. So if we see that people uh, underestimate certain costs or overestimate certain incomes or um, a thing that they will be able to sell their produce to a certain party that we know that won't be able then we really give advice on those points and that's especially for new farmers that is really in interesting and important to do um, that is less important for the active farmers we are for the active farmers we are rather confident that if they already are managing a farm for several years then we are confident that they will be able to do it 
And is this guidance and this Excel sheet available for, for everyone, let's say, or it's just for the people who apply for uh, these uh, farms? Um, we, we only send it out to people who apply okay. for, a place for, the, for the farmlands on the land canopy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? And I will continue uh, with the farmland selection. Um, for us, uh, this might seem uh, funny. We, our minimum is one hectare. And um, I suppose in certain countries like France, you, you don't do anything with one hectare, but Flanders has always been very known for um, a rather intensive use of farmland. Uh, intensive even if it's organic uh, so especially the, um, the vegetables um, for vegetables we use farmland very um, yeah intensively one hectare for us we know that it's uh, enough to have a start it will not be enough to have room enough for um, rotation for uh, um, for enough um, how do you say it to have farmland um, left in, how do you say it? I don't know the word. Land I rotation, no? Simply. Sorry? Uh, purely land rotation, no? Yeah, you have land rotation and, and you can you cannot continue to put vegetables on a farmland. At a certain point, you need a, um, a produce that brings some, um, like leguminosa, you have to bring a produce. Sorry? Top rotation? Yeah, well, and it, 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 you, you see what I mean. So one hectare is, is enough to start for uh, having a business, but it's not enough to have a, a, a fine rotation. So uh, we, we are ready to start with one hectare with the, um, with the idea of having this farm um, to, to make it bigger with another hectare. So two hectares for one person that works. And of course, the farmland should always be free of lease. And that is in Belgium, at, at least a very tricky one because lease contracts can be, uh, they don't have to be written. They can be just oral. So if a farmer uh, pretends that he has um, a lease, and he works on the um, on the farmland, and he gives something to the owner. Then the judge can um, can say yes, this farmer has a lease on this farmland. So it's a very very tricky one. Um, then, if those two conditions are filled, then we go. Um, we also check if the farmland is suitable for the specific plan of the farmer. Um, Sometimes farmers are so eager to start that they bring up pieces of farmland that just do not fit with their plans. Uh, then price, of course, is an important one. If it's um, too expensive, we won't do it. Uh, and another thing that is important for us to look at is if the first farmer stops, will it still be interesting for another farmer? And we, um, recently, we had a project where the farmers are working already on five hectares and they wanted another, another uh, hectare. But this new piece of land is very bad uh, access. It's, it's not well accessible. So for us, it's not interesting. At the moment when the first farmer says, no, I, I'm not interested anymore, it, there's no way we can make it wor uh, work for another one. Uh, we always do a, a desktop ana analysis because we need to know which laws are um, applicable on the piece of farmlands and we need to see if there are any restrictions. There is farmlands that you can only use uh, for, um, for pasture. There is farmlands where you cannot put anything of um, uh, tunnels. So we need to be sure what is what is possible on the farmland and of course this is this depends on on the on the local context and we also always go 
look into the farmland. We never buy a farmland without having seen it, even if the farmer is convinced that it's, that it's the perfect land. And even if the farmer says, yes, I have seen it. Um, and that's a good thing. We, we uh, have three or four persons ready um, in all Flanders to go on the spot and look at the quality of uh, the soil, to look at the access, to look at other inconvenience. Then if we decide that the farmland is interesting enough and it fits the needs of the farmer, then we go negotiating on the price. And then afterwards we pass on to uh, the notary. We always, we try to work with the same uh, notary because um, from, because there are a lot of issues with farmland and it's uh, nice to have a notary that is um, aware of all those little issues uh, in a way that uh, we don't make any mistakes. <clears throat> um, yeah, voila, that's, that's it. Any questions on, on this part of farmland selection? Then I can continue. So we then have a farmer, we have a farmland. Um, then we make an agreement and all the things that you put in are again, uh, depending on the, on the laws and the local context. In fact, we in Belgium, we cannot, um, if we follow the, the rules of the lease contracts, the, the agricultural lease, uh, we cannot demand that it will be uh, organic. That's a very strange thing. So what we do is we make um, another type of contract and we say that the farmer has the right to work on the farm land as long as, uh, it, as he works uh, organic. Uh, we offer the price of the official career long lease and we leave, we, we, um, we think that the farmer needs to be autonomous. So he or she can decide on everything, type of production, type of sales, uh, whether he or she will process a part of the, the produce, uh, the partners or uh, other workers. So we, um, the only condition is organic. Uh, for our side, and that is the only condition on which we can cancel the agreement. And um, so we, we think it's very important to have a career long uh, lease for the farmer, because that will make sure that he or she will invest a lot in the soil fertility and in the environment. So that's important for us. And then after the agreement, um, this is quite new for us. In We are busy since six years and we have been focused on developing our organization and having um, a way of working that is, um, yeah, set to point. What we would like to do from now on uh, is uh, bring more news about our farmers, news from our farmers to our um, shareholders and, and other people who are following us. And we would also like to organize together with the farmers a yearly farm visit or something to something that, that is happening on the farms. At this moment, we, we until now, we simply didn't have the time. And we are also thinking of giving those farmers other ways, uh, uh, support in other ways. Um, we're not sure yet about how this will be, but uh, that's that. Those are things that we are thinking of. Um, things would that would be possible is also assessing the impact um, together with volunteers eventually, or demonstrating certain techniques. So in a way that they that we are sure that they are working ecological on the farmland. Any questions? And then responsibilities as the owner, of course, um, as an owner, you have to find the money or you have to manage the money. 
uh, we work with um, shareholders' monies, we work with gifts, we also work with loans, uh, so that brings a certain responsibility. Of course, if you have farmland, you also have to pay taxes, or at least in Belgium, that's the way it works. As we are um, a cooperative, we are responsible for accurate accountancy and for reporting about it and during a yearly shareholders meeting. Then something that we already had to do, if a farmer quits, oops, sorry, if a farmer quits, of course, you have to find a new farmer. We, once we had a, a project where after the crowdfunding, that was really sad for the farmer. It was a new starter and the crowdfunding was such a burden for this person that as soon as the farmland was paid, um, this person couldn't, couldn't uh, bear the responsibility anymore and he quitted. So we needed to find very quickly another person because otherwise the farmland is being, um, yeah, it was, it's, it's not being uh, cared for. And other things that we have uh, had is, um, yeah, the local issues. Sometimes there's a, a problem with access to the farmland, or we even had a problem with trees that were falling on the on land of another person of a um, close to our farmland. And those things you need to deal with it. I think that's about it about our story. And. Petra, yes. are you um, have you got lands for livestock breeding projects, or it's only agriculture? Uh, at this moment, it's only agriculture. Uh, but there's one, in fact, who turned into a mixed farm. Um, it's a mixed farm where there are uh, a few pigs and there are six or seven cows. It's still not. A lot of animals, but there are a little bit. Um, I think the problem is that in Belgium, uh, farmland is that um, expensive that a lot of people who want to have livestock, yeah. they go looking for free land. They go looking for uh, nature land. And mm. um, even the price that we are asking is too much for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, then just um, a little slide on the access to land network before I give the word to Thomas, who will talk about Kutruland. Um, access to land network was founded in 2012 and it uh, brings together organizations, similar organizations in from nine European countries. And um, there's an interesting website, uh, access to land uh, you where you can find all the members several case studies uh, and so from next week on the the webinars um, so if you are thinking of starting it might be an interesting website to consult okay thomas up to you i will stop sharing now Okay, um, let me see. Oh, here we go. I can share my screen. I hope this works. Um, okay. Here we go. Let me go to the first slide. Can you see my screen? Yes, definitely. Wonderful. All right, so... Um, very ad hoc um, preparation for this presentation. So I'm gonna um, talk more to you, Petra, um, to just telling you basically um, how we're doing it. But a little bit of uh, introduction, a few words about myself. I uh, don't originally come from a farm. I studied economics and then I took a time out. I worked on a, a farm in Switzerland for a few months and that uh, was really, um, yeah, um, a wonderful experience for me. And then I decided I want to 
be engaged um, in the field of farming in, in some some way and then i got involved in some eu um, project and um, then i thought i don't want to sit in front of a computer all the time and i actually did a four, a four and a half year um, full-time vocational training to become a farmer in Switzerland. And then I, in my third and fourth year of my education, I started to look um, for a farm to purchase so I can be, become a, a farmer. And I had to realize that that's actually impossible to uh, finance. If, if you wanna you know, just buy a small farm and then you think, okay, you're producing food and how much money can you earn? And then you, you need to refinance a loan with that. It's, 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 it's mathematically impossible. <laughs> so I uh, decided um, to join a community farm in Germany, which uh, was a really wonderful experience. And that was actually the first farm that uh, bought land with the Kulturangenossenschaft, which is uh, where I got to know them. Okay, so just a few points to cover a um, little bit of uh, background and then I'll uh, dig right into the nitty gritty of uh, how we buy land. Um, so of course, you know, the, the whole historical perspective, um, the Romans, they came up with this concept of private ownership and so on. And then we, in the middle ages, we had a feudal system and then um, the commons were kind of the alternative um, to the feudal system. And uh, then, uh, yeah, then private property was um, established uh, for farmers, at least in Germany in the 19th century. And, and that really was uh, brought a lot of freedoms for farmers. But um, uh, yeah, um, so in 1960s, 85% of the farmland was owned by the farmer who uh, farms on the land in Germany. And now it is less than. 40%, I think less than 35% uh, actually. So most of the land is again owned by other people who are leasing it out. And, and these, um, yeah, they're, they're um, as we can see here, the prices have been exploding since 2008. It's very interesting. Since the financial crisis, uh, prices have gone up in Germany three times, in, in Poland, eightfold, in Romania, 15fold. So farmers can't really buy uh, land anymore. So it's, it's uh, all investment capital going into land. And um, so this is why um, we need Kulturland to help out here, uh, to help farmers to, to secure land. And we want to secure it as a kind of uh, a new commons. Um, so, yeah. So this is a, a very rough sketch of how uh, it works. Um, so a farm, usually the way it works is that a farm comes to us and they have been farming on this land maybe for many, many years. And uh, then the owner of the land, maybe maybe they die and then somebody inherits this land and they just want to sell the land. They have no, no more connection to this land. And uh, then the farm who maybe has been working this land for 10 years, 20 years, or even uh, 50 years, um, they now have, they're faced with this situation where they have to buy the land or they're gonna lose it and uh, they can't afford it. So these are typically the farms that call us for help. And um, so we look at the farm and uh, if it's a good fit, then we decide um, we, we buy the land and um, we have a couple of criteria. And uh, the first one is that the farm operates um, organically. The second is um, that the, the land that we purchase, 10% of the land has to put, be put aside for natural conservation. And uh, what's really important is that the farm is regionally integrated, so it, uh, that they have a social, um, they're socially integrated, you know, either they're doing a CSA or direct marketing or um, they're somehow connected to their local community in some other way, like working with, uh, with schools or so on. Because uh, if they don't have, um, you know, if, if it's just a farmer producing, you know, very good organic milk and he's sending that to, um, to, to, the, to the dairy and uh, there's no connection to any customers or people, then it's going to be really hard to raise money. So we, we only work with farms that have, um, have, have a social um, circle. So, and, uh, and then if we decide uh, we're going to buy the, the land together, then... Um, then, then the, the farm has this land basically forever. They have a perpetual use right and uh, it can't be taken away from them basically. So that's the short story. I'll, I'll get into the um, nitty gritty. 
uh, later. Um, so basically what we are saying is that, well, you know, citizens, um, people, anyone, um, you know, we, everyone in the world uh, needs land, you know, to, to sustain themselves uh, on average 2000 square meters uh, of farmland. And so uh, we're saying, well, you know, how about we all take um, responsibility of our 2000 square meters, which is equivalent to in Germany about 6000 euros. So if you think about it, you know, that sounds like a lot of money, but if you think that that's the land you need for a whole lifetime, then 6,000 euros is again, not that much, you know? Um, so um, yeah, so we ask people to, to buy uh, shares with us. So this is the firm, a farm I mentioned before. That's the farm that I worked on. This is the first farm that uh, Kulturlandgenossenschaft have bought land with. They were in a, a classical situation. They've been uh, leasing this farm for a number of years. They've been doing wonderful um, community supported farming there. And then the owner died and the children wanted to sell and they just wanted to have uh, a market price. And it was almost a million euros. They couldn't pay for it. And so then, um, that was the, the first time that Kulturland got involved in the land purchase. It was uh, something like uh, 13 hectares or something like that, uh, plus the farm and the buildings and so on. And so initially uh, we, we had a lucky break. Uh, one person kind of put up the, the initial amount for it, but then the idea was to crowdfund, um, to, to refinance uh, through crowdfunding. And so we did a huge campaign uh, in 2000, um, in 2017, 2000, uh, end of 2017, uh, beginning of 2018. And we actually managed to raise almost a million euros and we completely funded um, this, this purchase, uh, the land and the buildings. Um, I'll get into to, uh, how we deal with the buildings uh, on, with the diagram later. But yeah, so this model really, um, really worked. And, and so we've been uh, continuing to do this with other farms as well. And um, yeah, so each farm that uh, we buy land with, we, we make a nice site, a website for them, a separate website where people can then uh, sign shares specifically for this farm and so on. And with each farm, we make a little video. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an idea. I, I won't um, show you the whole video, but um, it's, it's this kind of standard uh, video setup. Am Stadtrand von Schwäbisch Hall. Wir sind eine junge Ernteteilgemeinschaft, eine solidarische Landwirtschaft. Okay, so basically they're introducing themselves and I can't um, really, I don't know how to fast forward here. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna show this for five minutes. I'm, I'm not able to, no, that was the wrong thing to happen but anyways okay so this is another farm it's the same it's the same basically the same video for every farm it's the same thing you know, you is it yeah the drone shot and then the farmer says uh, where they're at and what's going on and why what's happening with the land why do they have to sell the, uh, buy this land and why uh, why 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 do they want to do this with kulturland why you know why not some other uh, and they always you know tell their own story basically in in a, in a very short um you know one minute segment and then basically we just tell um our side of the story you know what is good Kulturlandgenossenschaft and so on, and that's basically it. Um, it's just you know nice pictures and um, and and just uh, giving the basic facts uh, about what's going on, and uh, and then some nice music and so on, and then everyone's happy. <laughs> um, and and it works really well. I mean, people love to see videos, and and this is it gets shared and viewed quite a lot actually. Um, oh, here we go. We're back. Okay, so we've uh, bought land with 22 farms now, and we're growing. Um, we're growing quite quickly, actually. We grew 60% last year, and this year we um, are probably gonna double in size. Actually, uh, there's a lot of demand. We we're currently talking actively talking to more than um, 30 farms, and there's currently 10 land purchases uh, being processed. Okay, so which, what kind of farms are we working with? So. Um, usually, usually we're, we're only buying, uh, we're always reacting. We're never looking for land to buy or whatever. Uh, it's always farms coming to us and they're like, uh, there's this land, we really need this for our farm and we're gonna lose it. And, um, and then we start the conversation. 
so it's there's always an existing farm it's already operational everything's already in place the farmer is already there it's, it, there's no decision of are we going to buy this land there or you know who is going to be the farmer it's it, the farm is already there and and they need to secure their land basically um, so we look at the farm and we you know we we check them out are they are working organically do are they regionally integrated um and and then basically i mean so our our understanding of our organization is that we are a self-help organization for farmers we're basically just a tool we're we're, we're a tool we're an instrument that that farmers can use um to you know i mean to, to if they if they would have to do this themselves it's really really complicated to to manage such a land purchase the legal uh, parameters are very complicated setting up um the legal structure legal entity um to to manage the funding you know even if you even if you have all these people who want to give you money uh, there's all these regulatory requirements uh, when you're collecting money. You're not allowed to collect more than 100,000 euros without um, setting up, uh, you know, without uh, fulfilling some some regulatory hurdles. Then you need to hire lawyers, um, and you know, even if you do all of that, then you still need to do all of the the paperwork to handle all of those participations. Then you need to keep an eye on repayment schedules and all of that stuff. It's just really a huge headache that farmers um, usually can't uh, handle, to be honest. And so this is what we are. We're we're just a self-help organization that that has uh, all of the legal framework and all of the logistical framework and you know the web website and the film and all that. We take care of everything basically is just to make uh, the life of the farm easy. And then um, and then we help them to secure their land, um, you know, for their farm. So we ask them to um, to fill out uh, basically a document telling us about their farm a little bit after we had a few conversations. No, actually, that's the first thing we ask, uh, almost like after the first conversation and one email, we ask them to fill out the document and tell us a little bit about your farm. So we have a little bit of an idea. And the thing is, if, if, if a farmer is not capable of filling out a three page document, then it's going to be really challenging to work together. Right. So that's a kind of uh, an, an entry um, barrier um, because we need we need somebody who is able to also answer emails, who is responsive, um, somebody who um, is going to be willing to also communicate with the press and, uh, you know, also, yeah, just uh, send us an email every every year telling us a little bit about what's going on on the farm. So if they if they are not able to fill out the document in the beginning, then um, then that's, you know, and that's already a red flag basically okay so then we look uh, we look at the land okay so somebody um is, is selling this land and uh, sometimes they're really generous actually sometimes the the people who own the land they, they they don't want a lot of money they are willing to sell it below market value and sometimes um, they want to sell it for the maximum uh, amount that they can get and then we need to look really really closely um so the, the value of land uh, based on previous uh, purchases is published on a yearly basis in Germany, very regionally. So we, we have a very clear idea of what the real market value of land is. And then we look at the offer. And um, if it's below market value, then there's no, no big question. Then we can do it, of course. And if it's above market value, um, up to 20% above market value, then we're like, okay, that's still within the, the margin um, that, that we're going we're gonna to do this. If it's between 20 and 50% above market value, then we really um, need to look a lot closer that uh, we're, we're not getting ourselves into a situation where we're buying land that is not uh, worth it, basically. And, you know, we also have shareholders and we need to, we are accountable to them. And... Um, you know, not not because we want to sell the land again and make money with it, but um, it, we're 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 also accountable to you know not be a part of speculation. You know, we don't want to be a part of this whole market speculation um, that's going on. And there has been situations, very rare situations, where we bought even a, a more than fifty percent of above market value, which was a situation where a farm really needed this land, and there was other offers. Other farmers were offering more money these offers were on the table um, so obviously this this land was in very much in demand so there's sometimes there's other criteria in place uh, that cannot be assessed uh, just from the objective market value assessment uh, this land might be close to a town for example and then uh, the closer you get to a town or a city the, the uh, market value rises 
Um, then there's some other factors like soil fertility, um, the you know the inclination of the land, and so on, which uh, gives some um, you know some differences to even within a small geographic area. There can be um, some uh, quite significant differences in in, in land value. But uh, if we go more than 50% above market value, then, um, then, then we change this requirement here, which is uh, before we buy land with a, with a farm. So up to this point, we already put in quite a lot of work. You know, we already talked to the farm quite a bit. Uh, we, um, we, you know, we, we, we looked at the market prices uh, of the land and uh, we, we wrote quite a few emails. Uh, we had a few internal discussions. So maybe there's a few hours of work in here. Um, so, and considering that we're getting a lot of requests every week, you know, we need to be very efficient in, in processing these. And, and we have a very clear structure in, in a step-by-step -step process, which is um, all in all the, the entire process from the first email that's coming in from a farmer or the first phone call, uh, to the end where the, the land uh, purchase price is transferred, there's 137 steps between there. And so this is the, this is the first uh, chapter where we're um, getting to deciding whether we're gonna buy the land. So there's a, there's a first uh, preliminary um, kind of assessment. And then once it passes the preliminary, pre preliminary assessment, we go to the next step where it's a, a more in-depth uh, process where everything goes towards preparing uh, the decision by the board of directors and the supervisory board. And here um, we ask the farms to get one third of the purchase price um, in um, from their friends and family or whatever their customers um, not they don't have to transfer the money but they need to write letters of intent okay so this is just letters of intent by people saying they're gonna participate financially and if we have one third of the purchase price and you know this is also a kind of another hurdle you know if the farmer or the farmers or the people on that farm they are not feeling comfortable enough to to talk to people that they need money then this doesn't work you know we need to know that they're going to be comfortable talking to people that they, they need money and we need to know that there really are people who are going to participate in this so once all of this done then we proceed to a memorandum of understanding between the farmer and us and between the owner of the land and us where all of the terms are clear but this is not a purchase contract yet then um, we go to the actual decision-making process on our, our end. It's always one person in charge of a farm. So we are four people who are working on these farm uh, purchase um, or these farm, these farm requests. And um, up to this point, it's always one person kind of uh, in, uh, you know, in contact with the farm and, and, and clearing all of these steps. And one, once all of that is done, the memorandum of understanding is... Um, stands then we still need um, the approval of the board of directors and the uh, agreement of the supervisory board so when we put together a decision making document where the official approval um, is given by our board of directors and supervisory board supervisory board only has to give it's okay for purchases above 200,000 euros so for, so for smaller purchases um, then it's just the board of directors so and once all of that is done, then, um, then we're setting up a new legal entity. So we actually set up a new legal entity with each farm, which is a very special constellation. And uh, the reason is that we, we don't want to be the owners of the land, but rather we are the partners of the farm and we set up a legal entity together where the farmers are um, involved in this legal entity and we are involved. And then after the uh, legal entity is set up, the farm, the farmers, the, the people on the farm, they are actually the um, executive party of this legal entity, and they are actually going to be the ones signing the purchasing contract. So then the notarized uh, purchase um, is then uh, done, and then after that is done, then we transfer the purchase price, right? Uh, so we usually we pre-fund these purchases and then crowdfund it afterwards. Okay, and then um, this is something new. So uh, everything I told you is basically what we did up until, until 2019. And then last year uh, we had uh, several requests um, or actually even before, but we never wanted to do it. And then last year we, we, we did it. Farmers coming to us who say they want to retire, they want to hand over the farm and um, they want to give it to us uh, to place it in good hands basically. Um, and we should look for new farmers. And this was, uh, we always said, we are never gonna do that. We're never gonna buy land where uh, it's not 
being farmed actively by somebody. But uh, then we saw, well, there's actually a huge need for this because uh, these farmers, you know, they're old, they want to retire and this farm is going to be lost otherwise. So we decided, okay, we're going to do this and we take over an entire farm, let's say a 60 hectare farm with the buildings and everything on there. And we, we take a risk, uh, kind of, you know, we buy the whole thing and then we look for people. So we, uh, we announced this in all of the um, different forums that, um, you know, people who are looking for farms might be uh, checking out. We put together a whole document about this farm, you know, all of the parameters uh, of, you know, uh, the, the land and the, the, the kind of, con you know, the agreement that uh, would be under which they would be uh, taking over this farm and so on. And then, you know, we get applications uh, by, by families or communities who want to take over the, um, these farms. And so far we have handled two of these and one of them is already kind of um, successfully processed, so to say. It's an 80 hectare farm and the family is taking over that farm and they just started working there in April. And the other farm, um, we haven't uh, completed the process yet. There's um, a few promising, quite a few promising applications and we're right in the middle of the process of selecting uh, the people who will be taking over that farm. So um, this is a little bit of um, a more complicated diagram explaining how uh, all of this is um, legally um, set up. So for, a you know, so this is the retiring uh, farmer not resigned anyways retiring farmer um then this is the legal entity we set up you know we set up a new legal entity we put the farm into this legal entity and uh and and this is the the new farmers here basically you know the people who are taking over and and this is the kulturland um cooperative and this is our non-profit foundation Okay, I know this looks very complicated because it is, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but basically the way it works is that, uh, as you can see here, we, the Kulturland Genossenschaft, uh, is a stakeholder in this legal entity and the farmers are a stakeholder in this legal entity, which is the same for every farm, basically. And so we, we basically, we have a, a mutual uh, veto right on, on things. So we, we tell them basically um, there's, there's a lease agreement that says they have the land forever and it cannot be modified. So only if the farmers agree, um, uh, you know, then the, 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 the terms could be modified. And, um, but basically they have the land forever. We can, we can never take it away or anything like that. We, we don't have that legal right. Yeah? So as long as they farm it organically and, um, and they have 10% natural conservation area on the land and they do some social um, activities, so to say. So we, we define what that means. So they're either working with apprentices or school children or um, uh, they're doing um, community support farming or so on, something uh, like that. As long as they keep those criteria, those three criteria, then they have the land forever, right? Um, I don't know if I should get into this um, in depth, but this is the whole thing, how we uh, deal with buildings, because we don't want to own buildings. That's really a mess because buildings, um, you know, the roof gets leaky and so on, and then you have to fix the roof and, and all of that. So we don't want uh, any of that. So basically what we do is, um, you know, we buy from the uh, retiring farmer, we, uh, and, and we, I say, well, in the beginning, there's the, the other farmer is not there yet. So, so at first it's just basically us, we are buying the, the farm and include, including the buildings and so on. And then as soon as there's a, a new, you know, farmers, a family or community who's taking over, then they get, they become the stakeholders in this entity, which is for the land. And then we basically, we sell them the buildings. And then we have another agreement here with the buildings that uh, the buildings basically belong to them or we set up a new legal entity. They can choose whatever they want, but um, it's uh, part of a 99 year lease agreement. So the, the land that is uh, under the buildings is leased to them for 99 years. And uh, in the contract of this lease agreement, it is stipulated that they can only use the buildings as long as they are farming the land. So if they stop farming the land, they don't have a right uh, to use these buildings anymore. And if they sell the buildings, uh, they are only allowed to sell the buildings to the next generation for an objective price. 
So there, there's going to be um, um, a person um, who, who makes these kinds of ob objective assessments, you know, and they will say what the price is. So they cannot speculate uh, with the value of these buildings, uh, which, you know, it's, it's very important because we're giving it to them very cheap. You know, sometimes we're even giving the buildings for free. So we don't want them to then, you know, leave the farm uh, three years later and sell the building for, uh, for a huge profit, right? Okay, so this is uh, our, our farm handover uh, model. Okay, I, I didn't do this, so let me see if I can. Um, okay, so first um, we, so there's, there's a farmer who wants to hand over his farm. Uh, he wants to retire. And then we decide, okay, we're gonna do this. So we, uh, we basically, we, we purchase the land uh, from them for the market value, basically, even if they don't want market value. And uh, I'll show you why, okay? So, the farmer, let's say, actually, we'll, uh, this makes it easier. Okay, so uh, let's let's look at this example first, um, just so you understand. Let's say uh, the farm has 40 hectares and um, at, at 25,000 euros per hectare, it's valued at 1 million euros. And then let's say the farmer says, well, what I want is 2,000 euros a month uh, retirement. Then we make a calculation and so on. And um, this 2,000 euros per month is, uh, has a value of about 600,000 euros. You know, if you calculate 2,000 per month for the next uh, 20, 25 years, 30 years, then you get this value. So the farmer, uh, and this has been a situation with, uh, with a few farms now that we're dealing with, the two farms that we bought, and also other ones that we're going to buy, they, the farmers are saying they don't want the full value of the land. So, okay, so then we, we ask them, well, how much do you want? What do you need? And they say, okay, we need 2,000 euros a month um, and, or maybe uh, plus 100,000 euros or whatever, you know? And then we say, okay. And then uh, we, 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 we agree to this. And then there's, uh, there's something, there, there's value left over, right? So this is the market value, 1 million. And this, um, the difference is 400,000 is, is left over. So they are donating this amount. And uh, they're donating it to the Kultur and Genossenschaft on the one hand. And also we have a nonprofit foundation, which is a part of the Genossenschaft. It's an unselbstständige Stiftung, so a non, um, uh, a non-independent, and, and it's, so it's, <laughs> it's a non-independent foundation. It's a really, it's a part of the Kultur and Genossenschaft. And so they're donating this money into uh, basically to us. Um, or the land, however you want to see it, they're donating a, a part of the value to us. And this has uh, huge implications for us, actually. I'll get into that uh, here. So what is the, so uh, the Kultur and Genossenschaft started in 2015 and um, here the red, this here, this is the loss that um, uh, we, we're, we're making. Uh, but let me take a step back. How are we making money? Okay, so how does the Kultur and Genossenschaft make money? Uh, we're, uh, we're asking far the farms to, to um, make a contribution. So we don't call it a lease because it's, it's not a fixed amount. Uh, I'll get into that later. But rather, they're paying a contribution to cover our costs. So that's one of our income streams. The second one is actually the members who are joining the, um, the, the Kultur and Genossenschaft, the, the people who are signing shares. We ask them to pay an entry fee. The recommendation is 5%, but they can choose. Usually on average, they pay 3.5%. So uh, last year we, we um, sold shares worth more than 1, 1 million euros so, and, and the entry fees were close to 40,000 euros. So that's covering some of our costs and the farms are paying some. And then, um, and then there's a, a little bit of money from research projects, EU and, and so that's a little bit there. Um, but if you count all of uh, all of the, uh, that income, then uh, our expenses are actually higher than that. So we're making a loss. And as, as you can see here, the revenue in green, but we're still making a loss. We're making a loss 2016, loss in 2017 is even larger and 2018 is even larger. And here we're getting a little bit worried and we're like, well, what's, you know, this can't continue like this. We need to, uh, and the thing is here 2018, we have like one and a half million euros in our bank account, but in our balance sheet, we're making a loss, which looks really bad. So then uh, we, we came up with this model here, right? So we're paying the farmer the, the fair purchase price, the market value, and then he's donating a part of that purchase price back to us. And uh, that's the, the yellow here, this is the donations. And so this donation um, then turns our loss into a profit. 
And last year we got uh, quite a lot of donation. So then uh, we don't have any more loss. And, and in our balance sheet, we have capital reserves of more than 600,000 euros. And um, so we, we solved our, our balance sheet problems basically with, um, with, with these donations that are being made to us. So basically you could say our revenue stream is uh, entry fees, um, participation uh, or, or the, the fees uh, paid by the, by the farmers and uh, donations in the end. This is for you, Petra. Um, uh, if you're thinking about how to how to cover your balance sheet losses, uh, this is really uh, this is the way to go. <laughs> but what you what you need is some uh, somebody who owns land and is willing to donate um, a part of that, right? But the issue is if they're just donating the land, um, or let's say the land is valued at one million and they're selling it for half a million, then in your balance sheet it says half a million, and that doesn't really help you. You know, I mean, you got half million in donation, but it's, you can't see it. You can't see it in the balance sheet. It's, it's you know, it's a, it's a stille reserve. It's, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like it's not there. And so uh, by doing this uh, donation model where you're paying the actual price and they're donating thing, uh, an, a certain amount back, then you're activating this amount in your balance sheet, uh, which really doesn't change anything in reality but um, it changes a lot in terms of how you can operate. It's, it's really strange. Uh, it, it changed so much. I mean, in two, end of 2008, we felt like we were being strangulated because uh, we, we, you know, we're making losses and, and we felt really, really tight, even though everything was going great, we're growing great, everything's going great. We really felt so tight, you know? And after we did these donation things, nothing changed, but we're all feeling uh, at ease. Thomas, can we can we ask questions on this? Yes, sure. Uh, I was wondering um, if you get a gift this big, don't you have to pay taxes on it? Well, uh, that's a funny thing. Uh, no, uh, and the reason is because one, we have a nonprofit foundation, so of course you don't have to pay taxes there. Uh, but as I showed, only a part of the donation goes in a nonprofit entity. So there, that of course you, you never have to pay taxes. But interestingly, also the donation that goes into the Kulturangenossenschaft is uh, tax exempt because in Germany you can um, you can give a gift of up to twenty thousand euros without having to pay taxes on that. And um, you know, here the gift is of course a lot larger, but because we're a cooperative, we are a collective of people and the, the donation is divided by the people. So, as, and because we're 900 people, we can take a lot of donation without having to pay any tax. The only tax that we might have to pay is um, if the purchase price is significantly higher than uh, the book value of the farm. So let's say the farmer has the, the value of the land in his books for 500,000 and we're paying him 1 million, then on the 500,000, we have to pay tax. But there is um, a tax exemption um, in Germany for farmers who are retiring. So the amount of tax that has to be paid is significantly lower. And um, yeah, so, so the amount of taxes that we have to pay is either zero or quite low. And another question, you were talking about, so you are, you have to find money uh, in some kind of way and all those people that are, um, do they all become shareholder in this um, new legal entity that you are creating for each farm so that the farmers and you and Kulturland and those people are shareholders or am I mistaken? Where does the money come from for so buying the land? The people become shareholders in the Kulturlangenossenschaft and we put the money into this legal entity. So only us as, as the legal entity Kulturlangenossenschaft is, is a stakeholder in, in that subsidiary entity and the farmer. And the people who are uh, putting their money together, they're becoming shareholders in the Kulturlangenossenschaft. And the reason for that is that um, because um, cooperatives are uh, very tightly regulated, we are allowed to raise uh, um, an un... Um, 
an unlimited amount of money. There's, there's no upper limit as to how much money we can collect without any regulatory hurdles, because we already have to, uh, we are already underlying so many regulatory hurdles as a cooperative that we don't have to have additional hurdles to raise capital. If we would use the subsidiary entity to raise money, we would have significant um, uh, hurdles in, uh, for example, issuing a prospectus or, um, you know, um, other hurdles um, where the financial regulatory authorities are going to look very closely and, and that's very expensive. And I just have one more question for you, if, if you allow. Um, you were talking about, and I think that's a very good idea, uh, to have a farmer ask for letters of intent so that you already have an idea of is this person capable of talking about money and having having a need for people to invest uh, those letters of intent um you want one third uh, from the from the price do they have any legal um value if someone says yes um i'm ready to give let's say twenty thousand, and then uh, at a certain point you want to buy and he says no i'm not does no, this uh, have there's any Binding in our experience, um, 95 plus percent actually um, do it. And even some people even sign more than they originally said. So in the end, um, it's, it's not really an issue. So you don't feel that it's extra work to have those uh, letters of intent made up? No, it's, it's essential. It's crucial. Yeah. Okay, great. That's a very... Okay, so then um, this is more um, kind of details on how we're doing the, the funding. Uh, this is not about how we purchase land, but this is for the farms. This is an important uh, question. You know, they, they ask so many questions. You know, they really want to know what they're getting themselves into here, you know. And so uh, we actually in 2019 um, founded a new board, or basically our board of farmers. Uh, where each farmer has one representation and, um, and, and we meet now twice a year, once physically, once uh, digitally, um, um, you know, as soon as Corona is over, we're going to go back to that. And uh, we get input from the farmers and they told us one of the first things they said, they don't, they really don't like this, uh, this whole lease agreement thing. I mean, we're not the landlords and they're not the leasees so we need to get away from this uh, this 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 vocabulary so the um, so what we have is not a lease agreement but it's a land use right agreement yeah? and and the farmers they're not paying a, a lease to us to us the big landlords because we're not we're not the landlords actually the legal entity is the is, is owning the land and and the farmers are the stakeholders in each legal entity so legally speaking, the farmers who are the executive party of that legal entity, they are leasing the land to themselves. They are signing the lease agreement as leasee and leaser. So what is it that we're actually doing? And what is it that Kulturland really needs? You know, we need to cover our costs. So what we need the farmers is to pay a contribution to cover those costs. So we, we thought about a model how, how to do this. And we were actually inspired by one of our farms, uh, CSA where they uh, add, give each member a, an individual recommendation for the amount that, um, well, they do a bidding round and they, they give a recommended amount and then the, uh, the people can place a bid. And so what we did here is uh, we basically, we just uh, said, look, our administrative work and so on, it's very closely co correlated to the uh, purchasing price, you know, the amount of shares we need to manage and so on and the members and all of that. So we did, we did a very simple, um, uh, mechanism where we take, we, we looked at how much we need to to really um, to cover our costs if we want, you know, if we, if we if we would just stop expanding and investing in in growth, if we would just uh, manage what we have, then we need a hundred thousand euros. And so, the, how do we divide the hundred thousand euros between our farms? We we thought that by uh, the end of twenty twenty one we're going to have four hundred hectares, and we will. We will probably have maybe even 500 hectares by the end of this year. So we said, well, we need 250 euros per hectare to cover these costs. And 250 euros per hectare is about 1% of the average purchasing price of the land. So basically we, we gave each farm a recommended value, which is 1% of the original purchasing price. And then they can place a bid. 
Okay, so this is a very complicated, yeah, it looks complicated, but it's not. Um, so here, um, this is the recommended amount. And here the farms place their bid and then they, they sign off on the bid. So on average, or it's, it's actually a little bit more, it's 1.03% or something like that. But um, if a farm is successful at raising money from their community, then, um, then actually the amount reduces. Um, okay, so we have one example here. This is, this is old. So there's about five or six farms who have overfunded now. So if they, if they get overfunded, Oh, for example, here, um, yeah. Then, then the amount uh, of the recommended value reduces. Do you understand what I mean? So, uh, we, we we tell the farms that within one or at at the latest two years, we want the total purchasing price to be covered from contributions from their community. And if they don't manage to do that, um, well, if if they manage to do that, then that's fine. You know, then then it's the the recommended value. If they manage to raise more money, then the recommended uh, value uh, amount that they should pay re reduces. And if they don't manage to do that, then the recommended amount actually increases. So we add uh, a certain percentage, but it's not a fixed amount. This is just our recommendation to be fair. You know, to give every farm kind of the same baseline, and then the farms they can place a bid. And as you can see, um, most farms pay about what uh, the rec recommended amount was, but some farms like here, their recommendation was 135 and they paid 200. And then there's some other farms, you know, let's say the recommendation was 549 and they only pay 300. But on, in total, uh, the amount was pretty much exactly what we uh, asked for, so it worked. Uh, yeah, and um, now, you know, we, we keep growing with 23 farms now, but at the end of the year will be maybe 30 farms and maybe in a couple of years will be, you know, 50 or 100 farms and so on. And as we get a certain concentration or a certain number of farms within a geographic region, we want those regional farms to be within one legal entity. So the, this, this subsidiary legal entity we've so far been doing for every farm, we want to use them for multiple farms. And we have started to do that with, uh, with, with two of them. And then, um, yeah, we, we, we will probably at some point have 50 or 60 of these legal entities in Germany. And then uh, our idea is to have 10 to 20 farms uh, within each of these legal entities, and they should then be able to act autonomously. So they basically use our uh, infrastructure and everything. And then um, if a farm in their region wants to you know, purchase land and so on, then they have their own kind of mechanisms going on and they can decide on these things and they could even use the, the subsidiary legal entities to raise money and so on. These are the numbers for um, the end of 2020. So things are moving quickly. We, at the end of this year, we're probably, we're probably gonna have 500 hectares. And probably, I mean, actually for sure more than 10 million, probably 12 million euros in total capital. Uh, here we actually put together all of the information in, in English. We, we translated all of our website and we are very transparent with all of our information on the website. Everything is on there. So you can have a look there. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank so, you. Tess. Can I ask a question? Uh, did you see, I saw that the numbers are growing in the Corona year, let's say. Uh, did you see any correlation between the coronavirus and maybe people changing lifestyles or applying more to farm or you would say this is a normal growing? Um, I can't give you empirical data. Um, my, our fear was that because of Corona, there's going to be less uh, people, you know, buying shares because there was a little bit of fear of hyperinflation, and there's still there's some talk about inflation and so on. And the thing is, we are not offering any dividends or interest on our shares. So you know, if there is inflation, then you're losing a lot of money on your shares, right? So the whole thing. Well, so we, we were worried there. So I think uh, there was a, a, a positive effect and maybe, uh, I, I can't tell empirically. Um, I think we would have grown like this um, also without Corona. And also, you know, we keep growing like this. But what I can tell you is that CSAs are getting overrun by, by people. It's really 
uh, intense. There's all, all the CSAs that I'm talking to, they have waiting lists of people. Thank you. And maybe uh, uh, I'm going to sh share my screen real quick, uh, show you, Petra. Um, uh, we we just started. We we used to work for, uh, for the last two years with um, with Asana as a project management tool, and then beginning of this year we switched to um, ClickUp. I'm just going to show you real quick. Um, it's it's mind bending, really. It's it's so good. Uh, we, you, we we really um, are able to have the, the you know the the whole process you know of the land purchasing. Um, uh, and and the activities, all everything that we're doing, the the, the project management, all of the everything, all the tasks, uh, you know, it's here. Here we have all of the, the farms and so on. And um, you know, these are the farms that we are currently um, in the process of in the process of uh, deciding to buy. And these are the farms that we are currently buying with. And um, so we we you know growing so quickly also means you know new 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 team members new people uh, working for us and then you know to onboard people working for us that's also a huge task, and this really makes it so easy. Like we we have uh, a new um, a project manager uh, with us. So I don't know that's a silly silly term, but a person who is um, doing the the whole process of, of purchasing land, and she's never done any of this before, never in her life, you know, and uh, because we have. Um, in this process where we have it all, um, you know, we, we have these, these templates. Um, so here there's, uh, there's, there's, there's two layers. Okay, so let, let me just show you real quick here. Um, I mean, this is, it's, it's just details, but um, it, it, it's creating, I mean, from a template, it's creating this whole thing where it, it from the very first uh, step um, to, to the very last step, so we, you know, there's the, we have, we have all these steps and then there's, um, there's, there's subtasks and so on. And this is just the, this is just the first step uh, for the deciding process. And then there's another whole thing for, for then when it's decided to buy to, to finishing the purchasing process. And as I said, there's 137 steps and each, um, each one of these um, steps, it, it, you know, it has all of the, the information in there, you know, with checklists and so on and, and all of the, the documentation and everything um, that so that anyone anyone who joins our team can can go through this whole process and there's really very few questions left over and if there's more questions then the people who know uh, more they will answer the questions and they're immediately integrated into the template so that next time the question is already answered and uh, I mean just uh, one thing I'm really excited about uh, like with these farms uh, you know, there's a lot of communication also, and it's very difficult to, to keep an overview of, you know, where things are at. And there's sometimes many people working with the same farm and so on. And uh, so we can actually keep all of our, you know, all of our communication is with, within here, you know, it's all documented. And not just internal communication, but also external, we can actually send emails from, you know, from my email account, I can send emails uh, here. And then the email that I sent, it's right there. And then my partner can see what I wrote to them. And then when they answer to that email, that email is right there. So everyone can have, so really, I mean, these things, um, if, if I think if, if we want to have impact, we need to create structures that are scalable, you know, mm -hmm. and and replicable. It can't be, uh, we, we can't have these bottlenecks of, of people who, who have all of the know-how in their heads. And so this has been really uh, what we've been working on very much for the past two years, especially the past six months, to remove all bottlenecks so that everything can keep going, even if every one of us gets run over by the bus. That's funny. We were uh, talking about this today. What happens if one of us, uh, gets under a tram in Antwerp, <laughs> what information will be lost? It's interesting. So that's click, click up, right? Yeah. They're pretty okay. new, but they're, they're pretty good. They're really good. And the, the customer support is also good. And um, um, yeah, they're, I mean, the value for money is just, it's really good. It costs uh, six euros per user for per paid user. And you can have an unlimited amount of guests. 
So we have about eight paid accounts and, um, and then we have external um, people we're working with who are just joining as guests and that works fine. Great. Okay, back to this presentation. Um, are there any questions uh, for Thomas on um, land acquisition? It was complicated. Yeah, I can imagine that it is complicated if if everything was new. Yes. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas, explain me one thing. If you um, if you get involved in more and more farm projects, um, will you generate sufficient funds for 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 buying other farms in 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 the further steps? Uh, well, we. So far, we have uh, managed, um, but yeah, I mean, liquidity is always a problem. But uh, interestingly, uh, you know, we we actually were looking at uh, taking up our first bank loan um, la late last year, um, and we talked to a couple of banks, and then um, it, it just so happened that we got in touch with a private person who is now giving us a, basically a zero percent uh, or zero point five percent interest loan. Um, for 1.5 million euros and then somebody else gives us a, a call and they want to give us 600,000 euros and then somebody else gives us a call and they want to give us uh, 300,000 whatever you know and so these things happen and then on the one hand there's farm farms and then on the other hand there's people who want to actually have their money do something good so you know we have both there's there's a lot of people who have money and, um, and more money than they need and they want this money to do something good here regionally i see there is a question in the chat um a question on a similar organization running in spain catalonia uh, maria would yes. you uh, yeah no the, the the answer it's not uh at least like not buying in this way like there are organizations as terra franca in catalonia uh, who is mm, matching people, retiring farmers and and new farmers, and uh, but they are renting the farms. They are not Terra Franca is not buying a farm, but it's renting and sub renting. Yes, but I at least I don't know any uh, in Catalonia and in Spain. I don't I don't know, but I I wouldn't say so. Hang on, my doorbell is ringing. Damn, that was really interesting. Yeah, I think so too. I think it was very interesting, uh, very dense. It's a webinar that, that you can look at another time. To, yes, and to all the details. one question, Thomas, you said <laughs> it makes a difference to, to buy the farm at the full price and then the, the farmer gives a donation. This is different yeah. than just buying it by the price that he asked for it. But why? Because yeah. it's for me, it's difficult to understand why it yeah. makes a difference that the farmer gives another a donation. Because the value uh, for for which the farm is in our accounting, let's say, let's say the, the, the easy example, let's say the land is valued one million uh, objectively, yes. market price. Yeah, but the yes. farmer only wants. Half then if we buy it for half a million, then in our balance sheet, this land is worth half a million. It's, yes. it's not, not worth one million, it's worth half a million. Hmm. But if we buy it for one million, then in our balance sheet, it says one million. And then the farmer, um, he got um, one million in cash, let's say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he says, well, I only want half a million, and now I make a donation. So it's a hmm. second transaction. Hmm. First transaction land purchase yeah we bought it for one million. Second transaction he donates a half million uh, euros to us and then we got a donation and this donation we can basically do with it what we want but you already had this money before buying the farm <laughs> well, that's, you? 
funny thing, you know, liquidity and uh, the balance sheet, those are two pairs of shoes, you know, the, the liquidity was not the problem, it's, it's never been our problem. Uh, but in our balance sheet, uh, it really matters, um, you know, whether you get a donation there, and then it, it, you have a, a beautiful black number saying you have a plus, or you have a number that's red, and it says you have a minus. When you have a minus, then it, it raises a lot of questions. And even, you know, we have a supervisory organ in, in uh, Germany. Each cooperative has to be a member of a supervisory um, uh, organ. Yeah? And they look at your balance sheet and, and they told us every year, well, you know, your, your business model is not working. You're making a loss every year. You need to think about, you know, how, uh, I mean, you can make a loss. You, uh, you could, I mean, you can you can you can keep operating, but it uh, it raises some questions. You know, I mean, how sustainable is a model? Um, it's, a lot of people don't understand what we're doing here. This is this is so strange what we're doing. This whole thing is strange. Nobody, you know, from from an econ economical perspective, if you you know if 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 you studied neoliberal economics in a classical way, then nobody understands what is even happening here. You know, and and then they look at our balance sheet um, and and. It's yeah. It just looks really bad, even though it, it it's not bad. You know, we we can make, we can have a loss, and it doesn't matter. It's not bad at all. We can we can have a loss. It doesn't matter, but it just feels bad, and it feels really tight. And then it, when it, the number is positive, then it feels easy and light and free. You know, that's the only thing, and it makes such a difference. Okay. Do yes. you put the, do you put that promise uh, on paper? If you pay the farmer one million and and he will give you back the half of it as a donation? Or is it just trust? It feels it's, strange to put it on paper. No, you, you can't. Uh, mm -hmm. you have to, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it would be illegal. Um, so it has to be just trust, you know? That's, you talk about it, and the farmer says, yeah, I want to do it. And then if he doesn't do it, then you have to live with that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great. Um, I think we can close. Wait, th session. There is another question from okay. Chris, who says oh. that if you are, Thomas, thinking to scale your organization in other countries. No, but we would be happy to um, transfer all of our know-how. I think a lot of the um, organizational structure we have established is um, to a large extent transferable and we're we're happy to advise organizations so we were advising an organization in Holland that is just getting set up we are talking to an Irish uh, land trust and uh, also talking to people in the UK I yeah I think a lot of this in terms of our project management uh, our legal um, structure uh, could be set up in a similar fashion in, in um, different contexts and also our IT you know we set up our own IT to manage all of this um, that is is all transferable mm -hmm. okay okay yeah would be great. I mean, we'd be, we'd be happy, you know? I mean, of course we can't do it for free, but I think we're very cheap. Uh, we, we will charge maybe 80 euros an hour or something like that um, just to cover our costs. Um, but yeah, we'd be happy to advise anyone who wants to. Um, and yeah, uh, if you, well, if you want, if you speak German, you can come and work for us uh, for a few months and do an internship. <laughs> okay, great. Um... Are there still hanging questions? Or is everybody fine? Everybody fine. I think that we can close then. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for sharing your knowledge here today. And thank you for the ones who were listening. Thank you for your interest. And then um, the webinar will be, will be available on the website of Access to Land. So you can still look at it another yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.